Hey, everybody, it's Stacy. What you're about to hear is the fifth episode of my new Type 2 Diabetes podcast. And this one's all about your legal rights with diabetes. While we focus on Type 2, there's a lot here that will benefit anybody with any type of diabetes. I launched Diabetes Connections Type 2 earlier this month, and I'll be cross-posting episodes only when it makes sense. Please share this episode and the show with anybody you know who's looking for good information about Type 2. It's available wherever you find podcasts. Thank you so much. Enjoy the new show, and happy Thanksgiving. Support for this episode comes from U.S. Med. U.S. Med sets the bar high when it comes to diabetes care. U.S. Med excels in customer satisfaction, ranking number one in Dexcom customer surveys. And online, they're number one in Google and Facebook customer ratings among large national diabetes DMEs. With over 1 million satisfied diabetes customers since 1996, they've perfected the art of delivering better service and better care. From insulin pumps to diabetes testing supplies and the latest CGMs like Freestyle Libre 2 and the Dexcom G6, they've got you covered. Plus, they accept Medicare nationwide and collaborate with over 800 private insurers. U.S. Med, your trusted partner in diabetes care. Your health, satisfaction, and peace of mind are their priority. Visit usmed.com slash Stacey. That's usmed.com slash S-T-A-C-E-Y. Today on Diabetes Connections Type 2. If you've been given a blood glucose meter, you probably know how to use it, but do you know how it works? We'll explain the chemistry that's going on here. My guest this week is going to talk about your rights with diabetes. He's a trial lawyer with more than 30 years of advocating in and out of the courtroom. He lives with type 2 himself. This is an eye-opening and useful conversation. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Hello and welcome to Diabetes Connections Type 2. I am your host, Stacey Sims, and we are off and running with this new show. But if this is the first episode you found, welcome. I've hosted another podcast since 2015 for people who live with type 1 diabetes. I spent my career in broadcasting and local radio and television news, and I started that show, Diabetes Connections, to be information and news focused. Same thing here. I want to give you info without nagging or lecturing. You know, when you have diabetes, you get an earful about it from everybody you know, right? Doctors and your family, maybe even friends. Everybody means well, I get it, but that's not what I want to do here. So let's jump in with a minute of diabetes facts. You probably know how to work a glucose meter, right? You prick your finger to get a drop or two of blood and you apply it to a plastic strip that you then insert into the machine. It's technically called a glucometer, a handheld device that tells you if your glucose level is high, low, or in range. We've always called it a meter in my family or, you know, glucose meter if I'm feeling formal, but it is a glucometer. Well, here's what's happening during that process. Here's how it works. The test strips contain glucose oxidase, an enzyme that reacts to glucose in the blood drop. They also have an interface to an electrode inside the meter. So when the strip is inserted, the flux of the glucose reaction generates an electric signal. The meter is calibrated, so the number appearing in that digital readout corresponds to the strength of the electrical current. So the more glucose in the sample, the higher the number. That info comes from an Ask the Engineer column at MIT, and I will link the whole thing up in the show notes. Some quick tips to make sure your meter is accurate. Most meters come with a control solution that allows you to test to see how accurate your strips and your meter are. Most doctors will recommend you use it once in a while. And you can even take your blood glucose meter to your next doctor's appointment if they check your blood glucose there. Compare your results with those of their machine to see if there are any discrepancies. Not all meters are created equal. There's some cheap junk out there, especially if you're ordering online and you know, you're really not sure it's a great idea to ask your doctor. And I'm going to link up an article from Healthline with some more tips about how to use your meter in the show notes as well. If you're new to podcasting, and I say show notes a lot here, uh, what that means is wherever you are listening, whatever podcast app, if you go to the episode, there should be a way to open it up and you can see lots of information, including links I put in for every episode. If not, if you can't find that in the podcast app you're using, go over to diabetes-connections.com. Each episode has its own homepage and you can find it easily on the website. 
Okay, my guest this week is John Griffin. He is a lawyer who advocates for people with diabetes. He knows the law and he knows about type 2. He lives with it. John has served as the national chair of the board of the American Diabetes Association, as well as the association's legislative and regulatory subcommittee. His accomplishments go on and on, as well as his service for people with disabilities. When you hear him, you know he is passionate about what he does. Practical information that I think can really help right after this. I went to a diabetes conference earlier this year, and I saw something I knew I needed to tell you about. It's called Secure Simplicity, and it's a game changer in insulin delivery. It's like a wearable insulin pen, a patch that's water-resistant, thin, and lightweight. Best of all, it seamlessly fits into your lifestyle. For many of you, remembering your supplies or the hassle of injections is a daily challenge. Now, you can say goodbye to mealtime injections. With Secure Simplicity, you only fill what you need for three days. And it can be worn discreetly under your clothing, making dosing a breeze. If you're on long-acting insulin, you'll still take that shot once a day, but your mealtime insulin will always be with you. Find out more. Go to clickinsulin.com. That is clickinsulin.com. John, thank you so much for joining me. I am excited to learn more about this. It's an important topic. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Glad to be with you, Stacey. Can you just start by talking about the definition of type 2 as a disability, it's, a, it's kind of a touchy subject, isn't it? It's touchy. A lot, a lot of that touchiness is because of misconceptions or stereotypes about type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, the truth is both type 1 and type 2 diabetes are both disabilities because they're both major impairments of our human body's endocrine system. Type 2 has different parameters, different symptoms, different onset. But both of them are a major limitation in the way our body's pancreas and endocrine system and how the relationship between insulin and carbohydrates are interfered with by diabetes. So it, it is a large misconception in our country about type 2 and type 1, but type 2 and type 1 diabetes are both disabilities. I want to explore that just a little bit before we move on. You know, what do you tell people who say, well, I have type 2 but I'm, I'm fine. I, I don't I don't want to take advantage of it. I, you know, I don't want to rely on it. You know, people have, you know, they live with dignity. And they, I think a lot of people feel like exclaiming this as a disability is somehow using it as a, an unwanted crutch. People with diabetes or seizure disorder or any other condition, they make decisions about their lives. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is, is something we all are entitled to rely on and utilize to have good lives. On the other hand, there are a lot of Americans with disabilities who choose not to utilize the statute, choose not to even let other people know of their condition. And each of us who lives with diabetes every day has that decision to make, and we respect the decisions those people make. Are there parameters in terms of what's considered a disability with type 2? In other words, you know, do you have to use insulin? Do you have to have a certain A1C? Or is just a type 2 diagnosis enough? Type 2 diagnosis uh, is ordinarily enough, according to Congress, because it, when we passed the Americans with Disabilities Act amendments in 2008, uh, after a series of misguided court decisions, Congress made it clear that Major life activities are not just sitting, working, talking, uh, caring for oneself, eating, but also major life activities are what our bodies and what our body functions do and don't do. And so type 2 diabetes, no matter whether, it's w whether we are treated by insulin, oral medications, or other means of, of managing blood glucose, it's still a disability because it's a substantial limitation in the way our endocrine system works. In a person who has no diabetes at all, their liver and their pancreas carefully have a harmonious balance to keep blood glucose in a very good range. Those with type 2 diabetes do not have that ability to maintain normal blood glucose by the mere use of their pancreas and their liver. They require some other means without treatment, without mitigation measures, without working on it. Those blood sugars are going to go very, very high. And so that is a major limitation in, in endocrine function. And so the parameters of people with type 2 can be, uh, some people can be without symptoms merely by 
exercise, diet, uh, that sort of thing. Others require oral medications, exercise, diet, and insulin, and sometimes even other injectables to help keep their blood sugars in a normal state. And so regardless of the parameters of treatment, those with type 2 diabetes have, they should ordinarily be people with disabilities under our law because they have a substantial limitation in the manner in which the body's endocrine system works. That is so good to know. So in practical terms, what can people with type 2 expect like at work? You know, I mean, if you're if you've been at a job for a while and then you're suddenly, you know, you're diagnosed or you're applying for a new job, things like that. What are some rights that people with diabetes may have at, at a, in a workplace that they may not realize? Well, the reason I'm chuckling a little bit is uh, people with type two often on the job and elsewhere get asked questions like, that's the kind that's just your diet and exercise, right? Or that's the that's the good diabetes, right? Uh, that's the one that it's your that you, you, you wouldn't have if you weren't whatever. Uh, and so I have sort of a gallows humor about that. But uh, oftentimes, employers, schools, institutions have little understanding of what type two diabetes is. They do not realize that people with type two diabetes they don't just have a problem uh, with glucose and carbohydrates being managed. Our muscles, our insulin receptor cells don't work the same way as even people with type 1 diabetes or people who don't have diabetes. So there are other issues that are out there. And so when people have diabetes at work, sometimes it takes a bit of an education process. Of course, that's none of the employee, employer's business until you've been offered a job. That, in other right. words, during the pre-application process, in the application process, it's against the law for them even to inquire because they're supposed to be choosing people on, on, on their ability to work, not what their diagnosis is. And so, but once that comes up and once you are given an offer of employment or are employed, then it takes a candid discussion of what kinds of measures are needed for that worker to succeed at work. Or in some cases, workers with type 2 don't need any accommodations at all, and they could even keep that information private if they so desire. Again, knowing that this is the person's choice now, right? If they're diagnosed while they already are in a job for a long time, do you recommend that they tell like human resources or do anything to sort of protect themselves in advance or kind of wait until something comes up? What's the best course of action there? My thought process is that if a worker who has type 2 diabetes that doesn't feel that any adjustments are required at work, and are managed in ways that do not involve coworkers or visibility to, to, to supervisors or others, then there's really no point in going to HR to say, I have type 2 diabetes, I don't need anything, but I have it. My view is that that's not altogether helpful because the employer's stereotypes may go ballistic and they think, oh my gosh, we've got somebody we need to accommodate, we have somebody we have to just take care of, or why are they telling me this when they don't need anything? Yeah. So that's my sort of thought about going to HR when there's no need or nothing productive that could be accomplished there. Do you mind telling me a little bit about your diagnosis story? Like when were you diagnosed? How did you find out? Don't mind at all. I was diagnosed on June 17, 1997, after spending a weekend with my sister who had type 1 diabetes and having an apple pie on a Sunday night and then peeing all night and being dehydrated and sitting in front of the television sharing with my spouse, I think I have diabetes. And so a trip to Walgreens for a glucometer, uh, a 650 blood sugar, and a call to my family physician resulted in me the next morning being a diagnosed uh, with diabetes, which was at then diagnosed as type 2 diabetes, for which that's my diagnosis story. And then I was on oral meds for a series of years, never insulin resistant, but ultimately transitioned to insulin, I want to say in 2000, 2001, and have lived uh, on insulin and other medications since. And have led a very happy, uh, uh, well-managed life and 
to my knowledge, no no complications of any kind anywhere at all yet. So I'm very, very blessed to, to have good care. And I tell people it doesn't matter whether by diagnosis type 2 or type 1, I'm on insulin and I live with it 24-7 just like everybody else. Are you still officially type 2 diagnosis on insulin or did they misdiagnose you in the first place and you have type 1? I don't think it's not a subject I spend any time with, but my I think my medical records still says type 2. Okay, now I'm being really nosy. Have you ever had a C-peptide test? Many times. Had fasting insulin uh, tests for many, many years. I probably have not had a C-peptide in the last five or 10 years because I think, as some would say, I think my pancreas has finally petered out. <laughs> I think my dear pancreas has done its best and served its time but is no longer able to produce insulin. I'm only asking in such detail because, you know, there is such confusion between type 1 and type 2, and sometimes defining it is not productive, right? Sometimes really dialing down may not help anybody with our goal today, which is to talk about disability rights and things with diabetes. But I ask because there's such a stigma around people with type 2 to begin with, and there's a double stigma when people with type 2 use insulin. There's a feeling of, I have failed. And so to talk to somebody who's been using insulin, sounds pretty happily, for more than 20 years, right, who has a type 2 diagnosis, I can't let the opportunity go by, John, without asking you, do you get those questions? Has anybody ever talked to you about it? Like, oh, you must have been a really bad diabetic to have to use insulin now. Sure. And probably like millions of other Americans, the first insulin injection that I had made in the early 2000s, I remember the chair. I remember where my wife was sitting, and I remember just a flood of tears. It's momentous. It's a feeling of failure, and I don't know why we feel that way. I don't know why our heads can't control our hearts to say insulin is a good thing. Insulin is a fire extinguisher when you have a fire. It is a slow, it is a candle that keeps your body, keeps your insulin, keeps your carbohydrates in a safe place. It is your lifeguard. But there is a stigma against injections of all types, insulin included. And I'm a doctor's kid. I had been involved with diabetes with my sister and as a volunteer with the ADA even in the early 90s. And here I am just weeping at failure as it happened. And so... Yeah, it's a, it, it feels like a failure, and people with type 2 get that, and they get that right along with the questions they got asked last week was, aren't you so glad you don't have type 1? Which, you know, where it, 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 the question somebody who, who has a seizure disorder gets asked, aren't you glad you don't have pancreatic cancer? Well, it, 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 yes, but we're not happy we're living with a chronic disease 24-7 either. But yeah, people mean well when they ask those kinds of questions. But people with type 2 get stereotyped in many ways, that they're sedentary, that they're couch potatoes, that it's their own fault. And they see this and they just make assumptions that are out there in the world. And it's our job to show that those are those assumptions are wrong and that there are people with type 2 diabetes who have served in many, many positions. And most people with type 2 have a facet about them that people with type 1 don't have, which is it's virtually impossible to ever be DKA with type 2 unless a person with type 2 has no insulin at all. But most of our type 2s in our country do have some insulin running around, which is an insurer against DKA in the event of, you know, hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. So there's all kinds of facets that we have for people with type 1 and type 2. They both involve the endocrine system and they both both involve regulation of blood sugar in safe levels to prevent complications, but they can have different facets and different attitudes toward them. Me type one, most type ones are adults, but people think of type one is the the tragedy of a two or three or a four year old child being diagnosed with type one diabetes. And, you know, we older Americans who are diagnosed with type two, it's a different kind of perception in the world. And that's just the reality of the world we live in. I'm going to jump in with a quick definition as you listen about diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. If you're not familiar, that's a really serious complication in diabetes where the body is producing ketones. These are like 
acids that can build up when your blood glucose is high for a long time. So it can happen when there isn't enough insulin in your body. It can be triggered by many things, you know, infection, illness, insulin pump failure, or not taking insulin as needed. So I, John, I just wanted to jump in and define that in case someone wasn't familiar with DKA. But I so appreciate you sharing all of that. I can't, this, this may be the most important part of the interview. I'm glad people are learning about their rights. But hearing from somebody like yourself to share all of those thoughts and experiences is so important. I would love to ask you, and I don't know if you have examples of this, but I'd love to ask you, you know, as a trial lawyer, can you share any examples of like a challenge that someone with type 2 diabetes made successfully either in the workplace or elsewhere? Like most of you, we don't love worrying about insurance. My son has type 1, my husband has type 2, so we're always checking to see what's covered. And it's great to see more and more plans cover the Dexcom G7 continuous glucose monitoring system for people with type 2 who use insulin. We even have it as a pharmacy benefit so I can process it at the local pharmacy. And they put it on auto refill for me, which makes it easy. One less thing to think about. It's worth checking to see if that's available to you. Dexcom will even help you do a benefits check to see what your insurance covers. It's easy and right on the website. Dexcom is the number one covered CGM brand. Find out more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Sure. There's a number of different ways that people, workers can can have barriers thrown in front of them at work. Some of them are not welcome signs, and we've had a lot of those in the past, of law enforcement, scuba diving, Coast Guard captain, commercial airline pilots. And then you have more subtle rules uh, that the employer has. But the ones that I found that are most easy to mitigate are ones or rules that interfere with someone's ability to manage their diabetes. Somebody needs carbohydrates at a desk or carbohydrates in a workplace or insulin in a workplace when medications or food are not allowed on the production line or in the workplace. A number of times those issues have come up and we have been required to share with the employer the duties under the Americans with Disabilities Act to say that that's what the act is for, to modify policies to allow people to successfully manage their diabetes at work. And so n no food in the workspace, no medicine in the workplace, those kinds of rules are ones that have been successfully abrogated, along with a, a number of jobs in America that were formerly closed off to people with diabetes, at least diabetes patients on insulin, that are now open. We have FBI special agents, there are commercial airline pilots, yeah. there are police officers, Coast Guard captains, you name it. I think the only real occupation any longer that, that has a blanket ban is the military and there are communications going on at high level to, to persuade the military that there should not be a blanket ban on young men and women who want to serve their country uh, while managing their diabetes with insulin. Yeah, I mean, it really is amazing how far we've come. I've done some stories in the past on the military, um, on some of the some of the studies they seem to be doing. Obviously, they're very hush hush about it, but they have released a few studies that indicate they are looking at diabetes in the armed forces. I'm sure you know more about it than I do in the position that you have. I don't know if you can answer this, like to go a little further in that. Well, I, I will go the most recent story. A year year and a half ago, a fire department had a rule that said anybody with an A1C of higher than eight, which as most of us probably know, is an overall measure of what blood glucose is for the previous 90 days. And this young man had been invited or get, his application was uh, accepted and he had a physical and they had a rule on A1C, but the rule that ensnared him was a rule that there had to be four A1Cs in 12 months. And he did not have four A1Cs in 12 months because he was so well managed and he had a blood glucose monitor that had shown his average blood sugar was effectively an A1C of six and a half or 6.8 or something. So the employer refused to hire him because he didn't have the four A1Cs. Wow. 
His doctor wrote him a note from Vanderbilt University that says he doesn't need, and it's not required and it's not reasonable, that this gentleman have four A1Cs and he should not be held back. And that case went to trial in Nashville and uh, resulted in a, a victory. And the expert witness was a friend of mine who served in the leadership of ADA, John Anderson, uh, who testified about that. And the jury found that that rule was not supportable and ruled against the fire department, who then conceded and got rid of that rule. So no longer do they have any uh, requirement of four A1Cs or you're out. And so that was another way that employers could erect a roadblock for people with diabetes, not in name, but in effect. And that's what we're always trying to make sure that there are not other barriers that are taking the place of blanket bans that we have already removed. Yeah, that's a great example because you know, to get an A1C, you have to go to the doctor's office, you know, make an appointment, pay a bill, maybe not a copay, get, you know, wait for the results, get a, some doctor's offices don't do them in the office. So you have to see the doctor, then you're referred to like LabCorp or something and you're going, so that's a great example because it seems very innocuous, but in practice, that's a lot to ask of somebody every quarter. Oh, it, we thought that it was ridiculous that they were punishing a patient for being so well managed. It was no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. It, it made little sense. We still have and we still see, although every case I've been involved with has been settled, a fixed A1C cutoff that says if your A1C is above eight, you're out, which makes zero sense because an A1C of eight has absolutely nothing to do with the ability to do the job. They let people who smoke and are hypertensive obese smokers work, even though they're far at more risk for sudden incapacitation than a person who is uh, otherwise healthy but has diabetes and an A1C of eight. Now, do we want them to be a seven? Of course we do. But it's not because they can't do their job. It's because we don't want to take a chance on future complications later down the road in their life. Sure. How can people be their best advocates, right? We want to advocate for ourselves. Any advice to leave our listeners with? My sense is let your life, your work be your first impression on people. Then they learn after they know who you are or who know who I am or your loved one, Stacy. then they learn this person lives with diabetes or they see a person like the, the German tennis player, uh, Zverev. Uh, yeah. You learn about him after he's fractured his ankle into, at a tournament and he's coming back onto the, the U.S. Open. You know, he didn't win it, but he got pretty far into it. And you see, wow, people with diabetes can do anything. And so when people develop first impressions, I would rather their impression of me being, well, he is a lawyer, an organizer, a leader, a person who's effective before they know, wow, he's a person with insulin-treated diabetes. It puts away stereotypes in a very positive way when we can be our best selves and then people learn this person's best self is a person who lives 24-7 with diabetes. You've been doing this a long time and you're obviously very passionate about it. What gets you out of bed every morning? Are you still excited about doing this work? Absolutely. I am uh, moving toward retirement, and I've been a commercial lawyer for, I guess, 40 years, a little more than 40 years. And the only cases basically I take now are disability rights cases, people with diabetes, people with PTSD, gotten an interest in service dogs for people with diabetes, PTSD, chronic migraine headache, that sort of thing. And of course, volunteering to help people with diabetes. And we're working right now on a, a, a driving statement for the association to, to ensure that there's a resource for public entities and individuals to have as a, a resource for people who have roadblocks or impediments, getting driving license, driver's license, things like that. So what gets me up in the morning is being able to deal with an injustice in front of my face. I know we're not going to fix the world. But a lot of people who know me know one of my favorite books was a biography of Oscar Schindler, who wasn't obsessed with fixing everything in the world. 
he made his job for, during the war of saving as many people as he could. And he didn't try to fix everything, but he looked at injustice in front of him and he did something about it. If I can do that every day, I'm a happy man. Well, that is wonderful. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I hope you'll come back. It was great to talk to you, John. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Great to be with you, Stacy. More about John and the policies that he talked about and where you can find out more in the show notes. A quick note, we talked about a C-peptide test. I wanted to explain that real quick. So your pancreas releases C-peptide when it makes insulin. So a C-peptide test obviously measures the amount of C-peptide in your blood or urine. And it's an indication of which type of diabetes you have or how well diabetes treatments are working. The test is used to diagnose some other things like kidney failure or pancreatic cancer. As you listen, I'm sure this will come up more in future episodes, but a lot of people diagnosed with type 2 as adults who don't fit the general, um, I'll say, physicality of type 2, you know, who are thinner, who might be younger, they may not have type 2. A lot of doctors just assume you can't get type 1 when you are above the age of 20, which is not true. So that's why I was asking John about that, about the C-peptide test. And boy, I'm so glad he was so open about everything. All right, lots more to come on the show in the coming weeks. I am thrilled you found us and I hope you stick around. Thanks to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. Over the years, my family has tried a lot of things, and we found a great tool to keep your insulin at the exact right temperature. It's called a ViviCap, and even in the extreme heat or cold, this does the job. It basically goes right over your insulin pen. It acts as a cap. You actually take the regular cap off the pen and slide on the ViviCap. It lasts for years. It fits all pens, and it's super easy to use. If you live in a place with extreme temperatures like we do, you know, in the summertime around here, Benny can be outdoors at camp. He was a lifeguard this past summer. It can get over 100 degrees and you don't want to put your insulin at risk. It's FSA and HSA eligible as well as TSA approved and they'll give you a two-year warranty. Learn more. I've got a link in the show notes. You always get a discount when you use it. You'll find the same link at diabetes-connections.com. Look for the TempraMed ViviCap logo.